What's up, college football fans, Mean Green fans, and SMU fans? This is Sonoy Valente with the Mean Green Show, and today I'm joined by CJ Olson, who heads up the fifth quarter account for SMU. And before we get into all things CJ and SMU related, guys, you already know the drill. If you're a fan of college football, college football recruiting, G5 football, the transfer portal, any or all of the above, consider hitting that like and subscribe button because that is truly all that we talk about. Also, if we get into anything today that you agree with or disagree with, let us know in the comments below. All that stuff really helps channels like this get picked up and go forward. All right, CJ. So, pre-tape, you let you let me know. I'm going to let the people know. You landed this morning, 4 a.m. from Boston, had a full slate of a day, mm -hmm. just wrapped stuff up at about 8 o'clock. Is that right? When you got done tutoring and stuff? Yeah, so I woke up at 4 a.m. I didn't, I didn't land at 4 a.m. Oh, okay. No, so I woke up at 4 a.m., flew to St. Louis, had about a 20-minute layover, then back in Dallas, uh, and then pretty much as soon as I got home, I had hat head because I wore a hat through the airport because I didn't have time to take a shower. So I had to take a shower, eat some lunch, and then I was off to class, and then as soon as class ended, then I had to go tutor for about four hours or so, and now here I am ready to talk college football after about a 14- or 16-hour day or whatever it is. Man, that's crazy. I, I I can't believe you went to SMU because that sounds like a North Texas grinder right there, man. That is that is impressive. Um, well, all right. So just kind of jumping right into the to this game that we have uh, tomorrow. This is Thursday, but by the time this comes comes out, it will be Friday. And first question is: Is SMU and UNT are they rivals or are they rivals? Yes, but at disproportionate levels for each other. So my opinion is, well, not even my opinion, my experience is I didn't know UNT were our rivals until I started running the fifth quarter SMU account. You know, shout out um, I'm at the UNT6. I didn't know who oh, he yeah. was until I started running this FQ SMU account. And now him and one Mustang fan in particular I have in mind, shout out Corey, they reply to my tweets and go at it pretty much every day. I mean, cats and dogs in, in my replies. But I didn't know that, like, SMU and UNT were rivals when I got here. They didn't tell me that. I mean, I knew that SMU and TCU were rivals. They they brought that up like in tours and stuff. And so I think like SMU and UNT are akin to like Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Like how Oklahoma does not view o Oklahoma State as like their biggest rival. But like for Oklahoma State, that's the game they circle. I think y'all circle us. We don't circle y'all, if that makes sense. You guys may not circle us, but your Twitter account refers to us as the team from Denton. And there is a Pony Up billboard in Denton. Pony Up Denton billboard in Denton now. So, Well, there wouldn't be a Pony Up Denton billboard if you could keep your guys home. So hey, when he's that, first team all AAC, just know he could be in the green and white. Believe me, we know. We we know and we're – it's that's not, it's not fun to, <laughs> to think about that. But, yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so – Rivalry, nonetheless, and, and it's a lot of fun, I, I believe, it, you know, even though if it is somewhat lopsided uh, due to the past record, but yeah, I just don't have hate in my heart for y'all like, like, I well, I don't have like hate in my heart for TCU, but like, I actively am like rooting against TCU like I I'm pretty apathetic towards y'all when we're not playing you guys, if that makes sense. Well, I appreciate it, CJ. But besides yeah. you, we we have hate for you guys. So yeah. that's that's just the way it is. But it's, but yeah, anytime that your SMU's not playing it, we'll playing UNT. We'll welcome you with open arms uh, to you. throw on your green and white, and you know just you know keep it keep it going. All right, so I want to start off with the big guns here, and I I know you're not interested in it, in the. A political field or a political future but you always give me a political answer and a, and a great one at that when i ask you anything to do with a quarterback uh or your quarterback room so i want to i want to see you put on your dancing shoes for this one so obviously mordecai probably better than we all expected i would think i mean seven touchdowns even if it is even if it is an fcs school in acu acu is not the worst ac ACU is not the worst FCS school in the world by any means, but seven touchdowns against anybody, that's impressive. So I feel like just, again, I, I know it's FCS, but he overperformed expectations. And, and I say that as a, as, as a G5 football fan from afar, obviously I'm not, you know, an SMU fan, but he did, he did great. And, you know, so what are, what are the thoughts from you guys on Tanner Mordecai right now? 
Yeah, so he's really good, as you mentioned. He didn't miss a whole lot of throws. Uh, the, I can only think of like two in particular where he put the ball maybe about three inches too high, but I'd rather he put it three inches too high when a receiver has a guy beat than him put it three inches behind him and then the defensive back can step up and make a play. So like even his misses were good misses. Um, and that was something like he's almost like the inverse Shane Bouchel, like where his ball placement over the middle and underneath is incredible compared to like, I thought Shane Bouchel's like deep ball placement was incredible. Like I can only think of two times in Bouchel's career, both against ECU last year, where like on a 20 plus yard throw where he just, what was he thinking? But with, with Mordecai, like, I just feel like his ball placement is, I don't want to say second to none because again, it was an FCS team. It's one game. Um, he didn't have a lot of tape for ACU to be looking at, but his ball placement is so good. And so I am very excited about, about our future prospects, at least for this year. I mean, who knows? He might, he, I actually have a hot take and I wanted, see, this is the problem with doing this. I wanted to wait. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Hot take. I wanted to wait a second week to see it. I wanted to see it against an FBS team. I think that Mordecai potentially could play himself into like a late first, early second round pick. A la like, like Kyle Trask was late second, but I could see him having a similar ceiling as a prospect because he's a little, I think he might be a little small as a prospect, um, but he kind of has like that to compare him to a former Oklahoma compatriot. He kind of almost has like a Baker Mayfield light situation. And I'm not saying he's Baker Mayfield. I'm just saying that size and how he plays is analogous to Baker Mayfield. What is he like? Six one Mordecai? I want to say he's either six foot or six one. And and not I wouldn't say he's a dual threat, but he can move. Like he's yeah, definitely he's, he's pretty shifty back there. I mean, he's yeah. I believe he was a dual threat coming out of high school, oh, like on yeah, was he, seven, yeah so. I think you're right, actually. I think he was ranked just a little bit above Jace Reuter, but we'll get into that later. He was, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, I mean, maybe not Lamar Jackson, but again, can move. So that's interesting. And that so what is okay, so Mordecai is what this year? Is he a sophomore on the field? He's got uh three to play two. I don't know what the heck he is. He's got three to play two. That's what I know. Okay. So or no, maybe he only has two to play two. I don't know. He's got two years. So he's got okay, he's got this year and next year for sure. Yeah, actually, let me pull this up. Okay. I, um I know that um he's either got two or three. Those are the two options if I if I had to guess, but I'm really excited just because, like, I haven't felt like if our quarterback goes down, like, we have options. And, like, we didn't even use one of Preston Stone's start, uh, games against ACU, which bravo on the coaching staff for that one. I know that a bunch of people wanted to see him. I don't blame him for not using a game. Like, those four games are gold because yeah. we could get an extra year of Stone but also have that, like, backup of, like, mm -hmm. hey, if Mordecai goes down, we are in good hands because we have – the best quarterback recruit of all time at SMU yeah. waiting in the wings. But at the same time, we don't need to feed, we don't need Mordecai to feel like he's a couple interceptions away from being replaced at the same time. So I like how we're like slow playing stone. And that was part of like bringing Mordecai in as they knew the stone, like stone and like his family knew that they were going to be looking at um, bringing someone in. And so I like, I like where we're at. I'm comfortable. And Derek Green is a veritable backup. He played 16 snaps, looked fine in those snaps. I mean, most of it was were run plays, which, you know, at that late in the game, you know, be yeah. kind to your opponent. But, yeah, I mean, I just feel so good about a quarterback room. But I want to ask you a little, about, uh, a little bit about Jace. Uh, is it Rudder or Ruder? Jace Ruder, yes. Ruder, okay. Yeah, so he looked I, – I haven't gone back and, like, watched Joel's game. But in looking at the stats, looking through the PFF grades, he looked, uh, he looked pretty good. So, yeah. So, yeah, so as far as Jace Reuter goes, one, um, pretty much our, maybe we had like w one number one receiver playing, but all, all of our receivers were kind of dealing with little uh, kinks, if you will. So, um, you know, we really didn't have mo most of our starters. Um, oh, man, I'm blanking on the name. Um, give me one second. Let me pull this name up really quick. Brown, I want to say. Um Roderick Brown. Hold on. Let me pull this up. I don't want to I can't believe this. I'm showing. Let's see. Oh, and I'll just cut in and say that Mordecai has three years left. Assuming I'm reading college football reference correctly. He's got three years of eligibility. Three years. Okay. And the, okay. Roderick Burns. I am so sorry for calling him Roderick mm -hmm. Brown. Roderick Burns. 
he was a former walk on and he led our um he led the night in receptions he with over or he had six receptions for 114 yards and a touchdown and he kind of just exploded on the scene again you know fcs team but Great. we were all thinking Dante simpson jair shorter Lorenzo thompson tommy bush you know those four bryson jackson who we got he was a tcu bounce back from blinn um we i mean at least four or five or six names that i would have put above um <clears throat> burns but yeah he came on and you know really really performed well but yeah so jace reuter he he's an athlete and i mean i don't think he had his best night he hasn't really started or played meaningful football in many years um and that was his first collegiate start but but again he showed a lot of flashes and one thing i was pleased with he didn't just you know one read two read run which again against the northwestern state and him being the athlete that he is he could have done that and move the ball down the field you know move the chains um so i was glad he he that he didn't do that but yeah he's um he's he's very much an athlete he looks like an athlete like just kind of like his his physical makeup um but yeah so we're we're all really excited about him and um you know we'll see what kind of game he puts out you, you know, this Saturday, I mean, I, I really don't think that FCS game was his best game, but I'm kind of chalking that up to just first game in a while. So I don't know really what I'm expecting for this Saturday, but it, again, um, excited to see him play nevertheless. Yeah, I uh, mean, just to let you know, I mean, Reuter ranked 16th of all the quarterbacks by PFF rank last week of the quarterbacks that threw like that had at least 20 dropbacks. So like, let's not go making it seem like he had a modest game. I mean, he had a very good game by any – by any standard, or at least by this standard. Yeah, and there was some drops there too. So, um, you know, a handful of drops. But anyway, so moving things back to your star-studded quarterback room. So you, I mean, you think Mordecai, and I may not, I, I do think what you said, late first, early second is a very hot take. I don't know if I can... And you, like you said, though, you were trying to wait till after week two, after an FBS team to to maybe make that statement. So that's bold, you know, whatever. But I, I, I think we could agree that's pretty dicey or high hopes for that. Maybe we'll yeah, have, I mean, maybe with, we won't. With all due respect to Desmond Ritter, what does Desmond Ritter do better besides play on a more well-rounded team with a more well-rounded defense? And I've yeah. seen mocks of Desmond Ritter going late first. Yeah, like that's if true. It's just that he's on that's a good true. team. That's true. That is true. And again, Desmond Ritter has significantly more tape, so there's more downsides to point out because Mordecai's only done it against an FCS team. Again, sure. this is why I wanted to wait at least one FBS game, probably like two or three. Like yeah. I wanted to see him against TCU before I went and made this take, but now I'm on this show and I say too much. Hey, that's okay. Presidential answers. I, I I'm Dr. Phil, wait. man. You can tell me anything. It's just between you and I. Yeah, and you know, a couple hundred other people. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so I mean, I really, I, I'm not saying that I think that's where he is, but I'm saying through, like, I had the thought halfway through the third quarter of like, he's really good. Like, I don't see, what, like, I don't see the the gap yet that mm -hmm. it seems like everybody seems to think with Desmond Ritter being like one of everybody. I'll put it this way: everybody treats the AAC Player of the Year as like a two horse race between Dylan Gabriel and Desmond Ritter. And after right. one game, I don't see that gap. But again, only an FCS team, only one game, so I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I um, I'll leave him nameless, but there's a quarterback guy who I talk with a lot who's not the highest on Gabriel and um, pretty high on Mordecai. So, yeah, I think I mean I think you have a lot of salt to what you're saying there. But whether it's late first, early second, or even fifth or sixth, do you think Mordecai is going to do one and done and go to the draft after this year? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh. He could. Um, that depends. I mean, again, that size, that's one thing Desmond Ritter does better is he's tall and you can't teach mm -hmm. height. Right. Um, or you can't coach height. Um, but I, oh, I seem, I had thought that he could grad transfer after this year. Just based I know on you, you had said that multiple credits. times. Yeah. Yeah. But I was talking to, uh, someone that's job is to know about NCAA eligibility. Like that's their full-time job is working for an FBS team. Um, and they seem to think that regardless, if you transfer during the blanket waiver period, you have to get a waiver regardless of if you're grad transferring. And so I don't think he would like transfer out of here, go to say, I don't know, 
just as an example, go to tech, right. sit one year to then play one year and that be his last year. Cause like at that point he's like 24. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't think any team wants to draft somebody that at the end of the rookie contract is going to be like 29. Right. Um, so I just don't know. I mean, he's either going to stick at SMU or he's going to go to the draft. Those are his two options based on the looks of it. And I, you know what? Here's my, here's my presidential answer. It's going to depend on how Preston Stone looks. If Preston Stone looks good, then I think Mordecai is going to bounce. I think he'll take his, if he has a fourth or fifth or sixth round grade, he'll take that because it's, you know, seven figures guaranteed. Well, not yeah. guaranteed because the NFL, nothing is guaranteed um, except for your signing bonus. And then even then, um, but you know, it's most likely seven figures versus potentially getting usurped. And then who knows where he's going to end up in, in the NFL. That might be one of those where you take your money and you, you bet on yourself to have a great training camp and, you know, maybe an injury or maybe, you know, maybe you do like what Dak did and, you know, you step up and fill an injury void somewhere, somehow. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, either good way. Good non-answer for me. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, so you think, okay. So worst case scenarios for you guys, in a sense, St Stone sits this year and next year. And then by year three, Stone comes in at, at the oldest, a red shirt sophomore. Sophomore, yeah. Okay. And obviously, I mean, I could see you guys keeping him there for, for two years. I mean, this year, I mean, I, he'll obviously, I don't think there'll be any qualms about him red I mean, he's a leg He's a legacy student with his brother on the team. Yeah, that's as a true. Receiver. That's I mean, true. That's I true. think we're okay. It was kind of like the first time we, we, we got on one of these, you know, whatever the youths are calling these videos we're doing here. I, uh, you asked like, were you nervous? We we're going to lose stone. Absolutely not. You did say that you were confident. You, you always have been confident. Yeah. About stone. I mean, there are certain yeah. areas that are not confident. Well, yeah, that's true about stone, which I would love nothing more than to see stone transfer out, but doesn't look like it's going to happen nope. anyway. So we know this point spread. You don't have to bring it up. I'll bring it up. I think you guys are favorite. I think it goes back between 21 or 25 points, you know, so it's, it's a heavy favor. Uh, and, uh, you know, but how does UNT, you know, come into Ford stadium and get a win? You know, what, are, I mean, what do we have that does concern you? You know, if you have to be like, okay, like, oh, if they did like, you know, how, how would that happen uh, from your, from your point of view? All right. So first things first, you got to slow the game down. Um, if you're gonna, I mean, the easiest way to cover is we play 12 or less possessions each. Um, if you're looking to win, which obviously you are, um, where does shorter play? Is he primarily slot or is he on the outside? Mostly the outside. Okay. So you scheme him against Bryce McMorris. He is a true freshman corner. Got his first start last week. And I really have high hopes for him these next few years. Like I think he's really good. He is really long and he's really athletic. He looked a step behind a few times last week against ACU. I I'm not saying I'm worried about him. But I'm saying in the short term, if you scheme against Jair Shorter, because that's a guy I'm worried about, um, if you end up scheming against him, I don't know if he's going to get the start again this week. I mean, he got the start over Armani Johnson, who's been a two-year starter at this point, who's no slouch. Um, and, and this is really the downside of all of a sudden recruiting at a great level. Armani Johnson was a two-star coming in, and he obviously outperformed that ranking. But now you have Bryce McMorris was a high-rated three-star. He was like maybe our second highest-rated non-Preston Stone recruit last year. So that's a very good guy, and he transitioned from safety to corner. So I don't know if there was a bit of a development phase, and they just said, let's just give him in-game snaps. That'll be how he breaks through and becomes a shutdown corner. Um, but in the short term, that's something I'm concerned about, but not in like a – I think that'll be the difference between winning and losing. I think we win by a lot, and I think that if he gets beat once or twice, it's okay. Um, it's almost like – I noticed the times he got beat, but I didn't notice the 30 other snaps where he looked really good in coverage, you know? So I don't want to like completely throw him under the bus as like, that's our weak link. Cause I don't think that's our weak link. I'm just saying that matchup wise, Jair Shorter is someone I'm concerned about in general. Also, Ruder is a little bit mobile, correct? Yes, he can. I'm move. worried about our guys breaking contain. We've been really good about getting pressure up the middle, but Ruder is talented enough. I think that he's going to know like how to basically avoid that. Um, I think he's going to be a little bit better than ACU's quarterback was about that. ACU's quarterback was pretty good about getting out of the pocket. 
but he almost like was too good about keeping his eyes downfield, not realizing that like, not that our linebackers were out of position, but that they didn't move with him fast enough to like account for the fact that he was leaving the pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a couple of uh, guys that I felt like uh, in the linebacking court uh, were a little bit, not slow, but just, I don't know. I would have liked to have seen them be like, have a better awareness of like a better play rec almost on what was going on. Like, ISM was really the big one. Isaac Slade, Matuatia, I believe mm-hmm. is how you pronounce it, the Oregon transfer. He was a late transfer, so he like he pretty much started school. like He got to SMU like, on the first day of classes or something. So he was a very late addition. Maybe not that late, but it was it was August when he transferred in, like mid to late August. So you know maybe that's another one where he's just back in getting into the groove of Jim Levitt's system. Um, but those are really like, and I, again, I don't want to single out those two guys because they, right. they played well outside of a couple of plays where I noticed, I was like, hmm, something seems off about this play and I'm thinking it's them. Um, but then again, there's a reason why I'm doing this for free and not getting paid to do it confidentially. Um, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. There you go. Um, but one name I am excited about, if Bryce McMorris, if they look and go, all right, maybe we filter him more as like a secondary guy in the secondary, like he's more of like a CB3, CB4. Brian Massey looked really good. I felt like I feel like he's really coming into his own. He got a little bit of playing time last year. If if we see number zero out there a lot at corner, I think I think that kind of neutralizes your chances. And then it depends on how we do in contain. I think that Turner Cox, Gary Wiley, Shane Haley, Delano Robinson, shout out Denton. Um, they're going to need to do a good job of keeping contain. I think that's going to be the key. So if you can do a good job of almost like forcing us to break contain, or if we beat ourselves breaking contain, and then as long as on the outside, we played a lot of two man under, I, I felt like uh, maybe that's just because it's ACU. We didn't want to put a bunch of different zone schemes on tape. Um, which I wouldn't blame them. I mean, it worked. We only gave up nine points, and one of them was like a, a rinky-dink touchdown. But basically, it depends on our defense is going to be – I mean, that's always the question with us, though. But, yeah, it's going to be the secondary and then a little bit the linebacking and then a little bit about contain. There's there's your answer. Man, that was way more than I expected. That was – man, that was – Second to none. Yeah, that's that's good. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all righty. Well, let's talk about conference realignment. Sure. So there's amongst some of us North Texas fans, there's a thought that SMU doesn't want us in the same conference as them. Is there any viscosity to that or is that total hooey? So Sonoe, you know how the Big 12 was mad at the AAC for potentially poaching their members. And then the yep. Big 12 said, we'll take Cincinnati, uh, whoever else, Houston. And uh, why am I blanking? Uh, Cincinnati, UCF, Houston. Yeah, and, and UCF. Yeah. yeah. So you know why we weren't going to be in the Big 12, like why we're never going to be in the Big 12? It's because of that school up in Fort Worth. You want to know the reason you're never going to be up in the AAC? And it's because of that team in Highland Park and in Dallas. It's – Sorry. It's that team in Dallas and in Highland Park. Dallas goes first. But tomorrow it won't when I post this. But anyway, just for optics, <laughs> Dallas yeah. goes first. There's no need to add it. Uh, I self edit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's it's probably going to be a similar thing. Now, I don't know necessarily, well, without UCF, Cincinnati, and Houston, we definitely carried a similar amount of weight to TCU in the Big 12. But before then, I don't necessarily think like, if our Gerald Turner, our president and Rick Hart, our athletic director, I don't think if they're, I mean, they are close to headquarters, so they can be in the AAC. They can be in Oresco's ear on the daily if they wanted to be Mm -hmm. without like needing to rack up Hilton points. So I personally don't think UNT sees the AAC and not because SMU doesn't want us in, but because y'all don't have the history of, of a football program that could get you in. I think right now your competition is Louisiana, UAB. Uh, let's see who else did I write down? San Diego State, San Jose State, Boise State, App State, FAU, Buffalo. I mean, those are the teams you're up against right now. And I just don't know what about UNT. Like, I'll be honest, Sonoe, I drove up to Denton a couple weeks ago because I needed to get out of my apartment. So I just went on a drive. Usually I go to Carrollton just because mm-hmm. I think that's a nice little area and it's far enough outside I can drive around freely. And I thought, I'm going to go up to Denton. I've never seen UNT. And 
I'm gonna be honest, I'll roll the dice on whatever Louisiana's campus looks like. I thought oh, it was you, all right. I, yeah, you'd lose yeah, that. You'd lose that bet. If you're, ta- if you're talking about La Tech, Louisiana, is that who you're referring to when you say Louisiana? No, I'm talking about Louisiana raging. Cajuns. Oh, raging Cajuns. I mean, La Tech. Heck, they can come out too. If Louisiana yeah. and La Tech want to join, I'm fine with yeah. that. Well, CJ, you're gonna have to come to Denton with me sometime, and I'll show you the the intricacies okay. of Denton, and we'll we'll go get an old fashioned now that you're 21, and. Uh, you you must uh you must have made, made a wrong turn somewhere, but uh, I drove around. I drove like I basically I pulled up a map on my phone. Of course, I wasn't looking at. It, I was driving. Got to stay safe. That's right. Um, and classes were in session, so I didn't want to run any pedestrians over. That's right. I think I got most of it. I drove around to Apogee. Um, I saw that whole uh stadium. It. I mean, heck, if you told me five A or six A football is going on there, I'd say hey, that's pretty nice. Um. And then I drove around like most of like I saw the basketball stadium. That was cool. Basketball stadium, very cool. Um, I, I did like that. Um, I think you guys, your basketball stadium has a leg up, at least on the outside. Um, I don't know what the inside looks like. And I do think our basketball looks really cool once you get in there. Um, other than that, like the student center, like it feels maybe it's just because SMU is kind of like with all the trees and stuff that we have, it's kind of, and it's flat. It feels almost like tucked away. Whereas like this felt like a commuter school. I mean, you can, you know, feel free to correct me. And trust me, with the SMU's parking situation, which I'm I have beef with the parking services people shutting down two parking lots two days before classes started for root, I believe routine construction. Could have done that all summer when nobody was there. Um, parking's been a pain. I'm, I show up to class an hour early and I'm 20 minutes late. Yeah. That's but that's regard uh neither here nor there. But yeah. I, UNT just to me felt a little, it felt very West Texas-y, which if that's the thing you're into, then I think it's a good option. Um, but that's not the thing for me. So I don't think of it as like a, oh, this is a campus I would love to live at. So, you know, you can tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, um, you, you but, are. <laughs> it's not It's not too often that you are wrong. Um, but this one, you're wrong. But no, I, I get what you're saying there. But, uh, you know, I really got to really, man, we, we got to put that before you go off into your big time law school or wherever, man, you, we really, we got to put that on the bucket list. Uh, it's, okay. We're going to, we got to show you Denton from the inside. I can and, come up for like a basketball game or something. Yeah, I would like to seriously. See yeah. We'll, uh, we'll take you to, uh, Will, he does a really great tailgate. We'll show you, uh, sure. He'll, we'll show you around and, uh, and we're going to change your mind. We're going to come back on after your, after your mind is changed. I and won't even gonna... wear SMU gear. I promise. Okay. Okay. I'll wear team neutral gear. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's, you know, but we'll see, you know, all this conference realignment stuff is, you know, it's interesting to talk about and, and you know, it's, it's the wild, wild West. And let me ask you this. So would you rather be a top dog in the American or mediocre, maybe bottom of the pack big 12? So would I rather play in the Boca Raton Bowl against FAU or would I rather play in the cheez Bowl against Washington? Uh, I yeah, I guess the so. Bowl against Washington. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those those FAU boys, they don't they they pack a punch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the Boca Raton Bowl pays, you know, like 4 million dollars yeah. less, which you can say what you want about, you know, that money like is a drop in the bucket compared to TV deals, but like that money is important for building facilities and building no, facilities is. is important for getting recruits and stuff. And so Absolutely. like, it's, it's like a not self-fulfilling prophecy. That's definitely the wrong word, but it's like a, it's almost like a vicious cycle for like the G five teams that they're always going to be stuck in that. They don't get paid as much. And then the ones that do end up basically creating these mini dynasties can like, almost like, is it not proliferate? profligate profl- they're able to keep that going because it's like a snowball rolling down a hill that's better than trying to use a five dollar word let me just use a metaphor of a snowball rolling down a hill is basically what college sports are when it comes to the the financial side of it so yes i would rather be a six win team in the big 12 which i know you said bottom half i'm assuming six win five and seven sneaking into a bowl with some technicality i'd rather that than a nine or 10 win team in the AAC. Now, if you're saying we can year in, year out, like basically we can be the Boise state of the late two thousands. Right. That's a different conversation because that's, especially with if there's an expanded playoff, which now with Bowlesby's feelings being hurt with UT and OU, like being big players in this and basically like Sankey and Bowlesby, like were two of the bigger voices in the room on that deal is 
what I've heard and read. And like this whole time Sankey was behind Bowlesby's back, like sticking a knife in each time he like visited him and was like being, you know, kind and whatever. And then, you know, behind his back is working a deal that's going to destroy his conference, which is kind of cold blooded when you think about it. Um, like that deal might be off the table. So that expanded playoff might no longer be an option for a G5 team. But if that expanded playoff is there and you can tell me confidently that like seven out of 10 times SMU is going to get there with the team we have, I probably would take that over the cheese it bowl. I would take a new year six with a playoff potential based on if we have an expanded playoff. So, okay. That makes sense. All right. Last two questions I have for you. First question is, what is your worst, best case scenario for SMU this season? And the second question is, can we get a score prediction for the game tomorrow? Or, yes, tomorrow. So I'll start off with a score prediction. I think we win 45 to 21. I think depending on where the line closes, y'all potentially cover. I do like it right about there. I think it's going to go under. I, bl- I don't know what the over-under is, but I'm guessing it's going to be high 60s based on uh, the fact that SMU's over-unders are routinely upper 50s, low 60s against good teams. Not to say that y'all aren't a good team. I'm just saying comparatively, like when we play like Memphis, like we can be honest and say that y'all aren't Memphis. Um, any given Saturday, but you know. Um, so I would right. say it's going to be probably upper 60s, low 70s. I think it does go under but barely just like the ACU game went under by like a point and a half. Um, I think that it's going to be something like 28 to 10 at halftime. Um, I am a little worried about us like shutting the door. Also, I'm pretty sure I said it was like 45, 21 and I have y'all with 10 at halftime. So ignore that. It'll be 28 to seven at halftime then since you know, you're not getting 11 points in the second half probably. But you get the point. I think it's going to be about a two to three possession game at halftime. And then I think we kind of trade punches in like the late third into the fourth quarter. I think we're going to be, I still think we're shuffling around our offensive line. Um, we have all five starters back from last year, but we we're moving some guys around. Some younger guys are getting the chance to kind of push. So I think that we're going to use, if we're more than three possessions up, I think we're going to use that time to shuffle some guys around. Um, not necessarily like blanket subs, but I think on the offensive and defensive line, we're going to, do some different things. And in the secondary, maybe I think we're going to do some different things. Um, So I do think it stays in that three to four possession range. Now, worst case, best case. Before we go into worst case, best case, one one last question for you. You think Preston Stone plays this game? No. Okay. No, I do not. I think we see Mordecai. I think that Stone is not going to play unless he gets hurt. I think that what we, what I'm taking from the ACU game is we're using those four games against either better AAC opponents that we're still going to beat pretty handedly. We're going to save it for injury because like, what if Mordecai gets hurt in the eighth game and we can use stone for four games, retain his red shirt and still have like a four-star quarterback, like in meaningful games. Now, of course, then, you know, you have to worry about like conference championship. Like if we're in this best case scenario, then, you know, then we do have to worry about that, but we can worry about the the conference championship when we get there. Right. Um, but I think for now, like, unless, like, I just don't see the need for it when we have Mordecai slinging the pill like he is. And we have Derek Green, who's good enough to clean up a game and not screw anything up, basically. Like, he's a very competent backup. Like, he's almost like what Shane Bichelle has been for the Chiefs in the preseason. Like, he's been very good, like, just routinely as a backup. Like, he, I would feel comfortable making a bowl game with him as our starting quarterback, which I don't think you can say for many third string quarterbacks, especially at the G5 level. Um, so I don't think we see Stone. I think we see I, – I do think eventually we see Stone, but just not yet. I think the, the fans are too excited to see Stone for us to not see him at some point during the year. But I think we see him in – like I think USF is a game we see him. I think Navy is a game we see him, um, depending on if we've seen him yet. I think as long as Mordecai is doing well, as long as he doesn't get hurt, we're going to only use Stone for four games, if that. So I don't think we see him this game. But it would be cool if we did. Yeah. All righty. Now shifting back over to the to the best and worst case scenario. Yeah. So after what I saw against ACU, I have our worst case in that six and six, seven and five range. I'm worried about Louisiana Tech. I mean, they played Mississippi State close, but if you look at some of the post game metrics, like they shouldn't have been that close. If that makes sense, like they were lucky to have been that close. Um, so I don't. I'm not necessarily saying like, oh, now I have that slated as a toss up, but I have that slated as a, 
hey, that's a road game. So let's just, you know, let's cross our T's and dot our I's on that one. Um, TCU, I'm worried about. Uh, they're good. Um, I'm, I'm man enough to admit when my rivals are good, and TCU is good. It depends on what Max Duggan we get, um, and it depends on what offense they're calling. I think Sonny Cumbie, uh, former offensive coordinator there, I don't think his game planning maximized Duggan's talents. I think it was good for previous quarterbacks he's had, but I think Duggan is a much better vertical passer than Cumbie gave him credit for and called plays for, so I'm a little concerned. Um, especially with what I said about our secondary. It depends on if we've smoothed that, smoothed that out by game four. USF's a win. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm just doing this off the top of my head. Um, Navy, Navy's a win. Even though we're going to Annapolis, it's early enough in the season where I'm not too worried about that. Then we come home. We have Tulane, I believe, for a home game Thursday night. I'm very excited about that. I'm terrified of Michael Pratt. I've been saying all offseason that I think he's going to make a huge jump. People act like he's good. He's so good. People people were thinking Tulane was going to be a middle-of-the-road AAC team, and maybe they are because the conference is deep. But I've been saying from the beginning, like their schedule doesn't set up for 10-2, and two, but they're going to be the best 8-4 and four team in the country, and you can take that to the bank. Because Michael Pratt, he took a Tulane team that I was not high on last year to like 6-6, six and six, I believe, with a difficult schedule. Like with the way the schedule broke out, like twice in a row they've had really tough schedules with like where their home games were, when their bye games were or bye weeks where they, they did have it pretty rough. Um, so I'm uh, a little bit more bullish on Tulane as a, as far as team talent goes, because most people in the national landscape, let's be honest, when we're talking G5, they know what our records are and they know who we play. And so they know like, except for maybe like the one team a year that's really good. So like this year it's going to be Cincinnati that's going to get all the coverage, but like nobody's going to really watch SMU unless we're ranked or unless we're on national TV. Like I can guarantee you none of the national pundits are going to watch this game. Um, because that's just how G5 football gets treated. Um, so for that case, I think that's why Tulane, everybody's so bullish on them or is so bearish on them because they look at it and they go, well, their over-under is like five and a half or six. Like they're going to win seven games. They're going to go to, you know, the the Hawaii Bowl and that's going to be that. They're going to be fine. But they don't realize that they're actually like the inverse of Houston, who Houston's going to go like 10 and two, but they're really like a seven and five team. And I believe that would be our game following Tulane. We call that a transition in the, uh, content game. Um, I, I'm not too worried about Houston. Um, I just think that they're, they always play us close. Um, they're kind of, if you want to know about rivalry, I consider them similar to UNT in terms of our rival. Um, although I do think most fans have more of a hatred for Houston than I do. Um, I think that just goes back to the Southwest days. I was negative eight years old when the Southwest is. <laughs> so. um, and then let's see, who did I not mention yet on our schedule? I think I've gone through seven games. I've got Cincinnati as a Yes, UCF. Uh, I, ooh, I mean, Gus Malzahn. What a roller coaster that guy is as a coach. Seriously, um, seriously. I really don't know about that game. I coming into the season had it at a confidence level of a three. I am since up to about a five, five and a half. It's a. Where's home it at? Game. Is it? A, it's a home game for y'all. It's a home game. It's going to be. I think it's going to be our biggest home game of the year. Sorry that y'all aren't it this year. Um, it could have been TCU if they didn't do two home games in a row against us. Crazy. I'm going to have been at SMU for four years, watched one TCU game, and it'll be a 30 point blowout at home. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, then Cincinnati, then there's Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa late in the year. That's that's a team I'm worried about. I don't know how much you keep up with big game boomers lists. Oh, uh, yeah. Did something about like, uh, like teams, every team is most scared of playing. And he had UNT for us, which no. Um, when I, I saw your I'm remarks worried. on that, yeah, I'm scared of going to Cincinnati. I'm scared of Tulsa in November. I'm scared of really any team in November. I'm scared of going to Navy on senior day. I'm not scared of, of y'all, you know, with all due respect, but, um, so I think I ran through our whole schedule. I think I missed one game actually. Um, let me just run through the conference in our head. Oh, Memphis. Uh, we traveled to Memphis. Uh, they have an extra day to prep for us. If I'm not mistaken, that's where we really got screwed is, our bye week, Tulane also has a bye week, and it's a short week, which usually short weeks really benefit the home team, but it's not a short week at all. It's actually a week and a half. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, Cincinnati gets an extra day to prep for us. I think Memphis just comes straight off a of bye week. I don't even think they get an extra day. I think they get a full extra week. So I'm worried about that on the on an away game where they get an extra week for us. I think that's just like a – that's going to be a loss at the end of the season. We go, yeah, we just were never really in that game, even though on paper we should be. Um, so I think like best case, I think 
I mean, best case I think is like 10 and two with a spot in the AAC championship or 11 and one with a spot in the AAC championship. I think worst case is six and six, seven and five, but like a good seven and five where like our five losses are nail biter against TCU, nail biter against Memphis, nail biter against Cincinnati. Well, probably not Cincinnati in this, in this world, but nail biter against UCF. And it comes down to like a couple of plays where if you look like we've gotten really lucky the last few years um, in a couple of like one possession games or a couple of like special teams things, um, our punting has been atrocious, but a couple of our like our return game the last couple of years has been a little bit on the luckier side. So that's something, you know, to keep note of um, is like eventually, you know, what goes up must come down. Um, so I am a little concerned that, you know, that might be, you know, a seven and five where we're a good seven and five, but we're what people thought Tulane would be where we go to the Hawaii bowl and they're like, ah, they're, you know, the 65th or 75th best team in the country when really we're in, you know, the 40 to 50 range, but we're seven and five and nobody watches G5 outside of the top 25 teams. But I think most likely to finally sum up your final question, I think most likely we are somewhere in that eight and four to nine and three range. I think uh, Cincinnati and Memphis are two games I've ske- I've circled as uh, either losses or like, I would not be surprised whatsoever about losses. And then between TCU, even Louisiana Tech, I'll put as a not a toss up, but like a six and a half out of ten. UCF, Tulsa to end the season is always trouble. Tulane, those would be the games I'd say are going to be like they'd be good games to watch if you're like not a fan of either team and you just want to watch like good football. I expect those games to be good. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, all right, CJ. Um, I don't. I think we pretty much nailed everything. Where can everybody find you on? Yeah, so you can follow my SMU takes at FQ underscore SMU on Twitter. Um, you can also go to fifthquarter.net. I'm I'm writing articles there. Um, let me pull up my – it's fifthquarter.net slash author slash CJ Olson 2000. If you want to read some of the things I've been writing, I haven't written in like a week or so. I've been uh, – I do – I am one of the co-chairs of the fifth quarter top 25 poll. So by that I mean I send out the email and then – an hour before the deadline that I set, I have to reach out to about half of the people to let them know that they still haven't submitted a poll. And then uh, and then I put it into a spreadsheet and then it spits out what all the different points are. And then I get yelled at online about how we don't know anything about football and that we don't we didn't take any time to do any of this. And that's just how it goes, you know? And I, I do make a tier list every week, uh, one through eight. Um, it was just... I started doing it last year, um, and that was something I've been doing. I have been meaning to do it for this week because of that uh, trip to Boston. I've just my schedule has been a little crazy in terms of getting that done. I mean, the non-school work has taken a backseat, um, but I'm going to be starting that back up again for next week. Um, I believe UNT is either in tier six or tier seven. So, you know, okay, I've asked them you in tier five in case you're curious. But the difference all right, is, all right, whatever. it's not too far apart. The yeah. the idea is like the tiers are about one possession apart. Now, obviously, in the polar opposites, it's not that easy because, like, if Alabama played, like, UConn, well, it might be a 56-point spread. But, like, if Alabama played one of the better teams in Tier 8, like Vanderbilt, it's probably not going to be a 56-point spread. So it's not a perfect one-for-one one in terms of possession. But within a few tiers, like, between four and seven, I think it would be about a three-possession game. So that's really what the – in my head, that's, like, the idea of what it's supposed to be. So I keep track of that, and I post that, and then get told I don't know anything about college football. And so that's pretty much just how it goes. Uh, for me, you can follow me at CJ Olson 2000. Shout out to Tulsa fans that in the way too early prediction when I said y'all are going to be five and seven told me I haven't been watching football. Um, that's cool. Um, lost to UC Davis. Uh, and the Tulane and UCF fans that were like, I don't see us going 11 and one. Or I said I had like Tulane at eight and four, nine and three. And they're like, I don't think he knows what he's talking about, but we'll take it. Have some faith in me, guys. I know. I, I kind of know. Um, but yeah, so you can follow me also at CJ Olson 2000. Um, my podcast at the RTP pod, we talk SMU. If you're listening to this and are like, I'm an SMU fan, and this 45 minutes was not enough, CJ, you can follow uh, at the RTP pod, and I'm podcasting there about SMU. We probably won't get one up for the UNT game in time just because the turnaround would be, it would be like tomorrow morning when we record, and that's just not going to happen. But I, I, I release uh, sports gambling picks every day as well, and I let you know how many units over and under I, or uh, plus and minus I am like baseball. I'm down about 0.02 units per pick. Um, and I've made over a thousand picks. So if you put it like, I think if you put like a thousand dollars on every pick I've made, you'd be down a couple grand by now. Um, so don't do that. 
But if you're somebody that likes to put, you know, 10 bucks on a, on an out of town regular season baseball game, because that's what you need to really be into it. You know, on average, you've probably, you've maybe lost like 50 bucks all year on my like 1200 picks. So if you want to have a good time, you can do that on college football. I'm plus money on the year. I'm up like half a unit per pick, which is pretty good. I, I've been doing really more than I can say. I've been doing really well in the over unders. That's the, that's the big thing. Um, I've been pretty fire with the over unders and I, Last year for the NFL, I was plus money on over-unders as well. So when it comes to football over-unders, I know what I'm talking about. Even though I'm bad on spreads, I'm like lower than 50% on spreads, which means most of the times I'm like, this is going to be a 24-21 slugfest that's going under. And then I just pick the wrong team to win, but it's still 24-21. And so under cash is either way. It doesn't matter who you think is going to win for that. So that's, that's where you can find all of what I'm doing. If my five-minute plugs weren't enough, I talk a lot on Twitter. So you can follow me on those. So. Well, all right, CJ. Once again, thanks for always jumping on. And uh, guys, really, CJ Olson, remember the name. Even if you did go to that god-awful school in Highland Park, he's going to be a, a big name in this sport uh, for an NFL team here in the near future. Just take that word and take it to the bank. It's it's going to happen. And CJ, I hope you enjoy the game Saturday. And uh, who you. knows, we might serve up a little uh, little upset, upset well, sauce. Yeah, I'd rather you didn't do that. But uh, will you be making it up to Dallas? I initially I wasn't planning on it and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it work with my schedule, but if it happens, I will definitely, are you going to, I'm, I'm assuming you'll be there. Yes, I will be. Yeah. Okay. So then if that happens, I will definitely hit you up and see what you are up to. All right. Sweet. Well, it's parents weekend. So there will be a lot of people there. It'll be, it'll be a full house. So. All right. Well, Hey, it's a, it's a family affair, but all right, CJ. Well, once again, thanks for coming on and uh, you know, we'll see what happens Saturday. Go mean green.